Okay, so let's start this uh, first afternoon session, which is essentially about quantum communication complexity. There's been a lot of very exciting development in quantum communication complexity uh, recently. Um, um, one connection between the two following talks is that they will both use this notion of information complexity, which has been used recently quite extensively in the classical uh, case, and uh, more recently it's now been exported to quantum uh, communication complexity. Uh, the first talk will be given by Anurag Anshu. As you can see, it's, there's a long list uh, of authors. It's a very big collaboration, and actu actually this talk is uh, is in. A, is part of a long series of break, uh, uh, many breakthrough results in many different um, uh, complexity models. Uh, it started in, in uh, query complexity and then it was exported to co communication complexity and now even in quantum communication complexity. So these are very uh, interesting uh, results and I leave the floor to Anurag to explain you all about this. Thanks, Jeremy. Hi, everyone. Uh, this, this work was done with, as Jeremy said, a lot of people, so let me introduce them to you. So Alexander Belovs is at University of Latvia. He's a faculty there. Shalev Ben David is at MIT, and he's on the job market this year. Then we have Mika Goose, who's a postdoc at Harvard. We have Rahul Jain from NUS. Robin Kothari from MIT as well, and he as well is on the job market. And we have Troy Lee from NUS and NTU, and Miklos Santa from NUS and CQT as well. Okay. So just a very simple plan for this talk, I'll give some background and then our separations. Okay. So let's look into separations in query complexity. Let me define a few things here. So for a function f, I'll call the randomized query complexity I'll denote it by r of dtf, quantum I'll call q dtf, and you can, you're allowed to make an error of one third in both cases. So in the beginning of quantum information, uh, a famous result was due to Grover which gave the first quadratic separation for a total function in the query setting. So, so there was Grover's search and its variant, which was proved in this reference over here. Oops, yeah. So what he showed really is that take the OR function, which outputs one if there is even a single one in the input. So the randomized complexity for, query complexity for this function is n. You have to look everywhere, but quantum query complexity becomes square root of n. So it gives a quadratic separation between randomized and quantum. So let me introduce communication complexity for a bit. We have Alice and Bob, and there is a function they wish to compute. And I'll call the randomized communication complexity with RF, quantum with QF, and there'll be a notion of information complexity about which you will hear more in the next talk by Dave. And it basically says, what is the amount of information about the input that must be revealed for the function to be properly computed? So this has to be the information that Alice has to reveal to Bob about her input and vice versa. So this earlier result of quadratic separation was already ported very early uh, to the communication setting. So there was an observation made by this in this reference by Berman, Cleve, and Wigderson, which, uh, which says that a quantum query algorithm gives rise to a quantum communication protocol for a related, related function. So let's look at disjointness, which says that if your input has a subset x and a y, then your output is 0 if the subsets are disjoint, otherwise your output is 1. It is not very hard to see that disjointness is actually or composed with this thing. So what is it? You compute the x1 and y1 of, suppose you're given an input x, x and y, you compute the and of x and y1, look at the output. Compute the and of x2 and y2, look at the output, and similarly x and yn, and compute the or of that. So what they observed in this paper is that using the query algorithm of Grover search, you can, you can construct a distributed Grover search, uh, a, a communication protocol, which takes place between Alice and Bob, such that the quantum communication communication combination of disjointness becomes square root of n. And in next talk by Dave, you will hear more about this connection about, for the disjointness protocol. Anyway, so let's continue. And there are already known results which show that the randomized communication complexity of design is n. It was a non-trivial result by these two reference. So it gives a quadratic separation between randomized and quantum in the communication world as well. All right. So we have a bit more, more things. So recently, by Aronson, Ben David, and Kothari, uh, a technique of cheat sheet was introduced. And it, it, it's of this form. Uh, you have c copies of a function, which let's call it a parent function, and there is a separate part of the input, which, is, which we will call cheat sheet. 
you, you, you compute each of these functions, f1 to fc, you get a c bit string, and convert that into decimal. Go to the, that location over here, and then there is a separate function, which jointly depends on this location over here, where you went by computing these guys, and the original input over here. And then using the joint function, you construct the resulting output of the whole function. So this whole function is called f of cs, f of cheat sheet. So what they showed is that there is a choice of f, and there is a choice of a function that's jointly taking inputs over the location and the inputs here, such that the quantum query combination is something, but randomized is 2.5 times of that. It, it was the first separation between quantum and randomized, which was beyond quadratic, in the setting of total functions. For partial functions, exponential separations are already known. So we'll keep this result in mind. It's very important for us. Now let's go to some other notions of query complexity. So there is a notion of exact quantum query complexity, in which case you're not allowed to make any error at all. It's an analogous to randomized query complexity where you're not allowed to make any error as well. So, so again, we, we can also define the same thing for communication complexity. We just say that, okay, you follow your protocol, but don't make any error. It was shown by Ambianis in 2012 that there is a function for which randomized and exact quantum are related in this way. So whenever I go, say this thing, I mean that randomized is this to the power of this. So this is the separation, the power of the separation. And the, same, and the variant of the same function also went to the communication world. Uh, and there also the same, the same uh, separation between randomized and, and exact quantum was known. Again, last year, using the framework of cheat sheet, the authors improved this thing to 1.5. But the communication part still stayed where it was, at least last year. And okay, one more notion I'll need, and this is a classical notion, it's called unambiguous certificate complexity. It's a lower bound on deterministic query complexity. Well, it's always smaller than deterministic, but how, how is it related with randomized uh, complexity. So last year, in the, as Jeremy said, there was a series of breakthroughs last year, and the f the f one of the first one was this one. We showed a first superlinear separation between this notion and deterministic query complexity. And later, a similar separation was shown by uh, these authors plus Jairam, where randomized and unambiguous certificate complexity were separated. And the same thing also held for quantum case. Sorry, for the communication case. This was improved using the cheat sheet framework by Ambianis, Kokanis, and Kotari, uh, again last year, to a, factor, to a power two separation, which is optimal. But the communication part still stayed where it had been shown by, uh, shown earlier. So here's the question. Can we achieve a super disjointness in the communication world as well? So as you saw that the disjointed itself is a lifted version of a query problem called OR. So you have a gadget, which is AND gadget. You take those two, you compute the and of x and y1, okay, I, I believe it was over here. Sorry, yeah. You compute the and of x and y1, and then you feed into the or function. So we'll call and a gadget, which is used to make the problem hard. And we can ask that, is there a gadget which just directly lifts all these separations in the query part straight to the communication? So make it 2.5, make it 1.5, make it 2. But the problem is that no such, no such gadget is known. What is known is a, so for example, the AND gadget that was used for the disjoint case is pretty terrible gadget for other functions. So for example, AND of AND is very easy. Just I'll just send the AND of all the X here. Bob will compute the AND. They'll just AND of AND, do, do all AND. So it's very easy to compute. But there's another gadget called inner product, which lifts a lower bound on the randomized to a lower bound on the randomized, even from query to communication. Unfortunately, we have no idea how does the, how does this, this lifting happen for the cheat sheet function? It's too complicated to analyze. So what we do is that we directly work in the communication world, and we proceed in the following way. Just like it was defined in the case of Ambianis, Kotari, and Ben David, we'll define a function which we'll call lookup function. It's of a very similar flavor, but we just express it in, the, in a generic form. It has following components. Take any communication function which takes some inputs, x and y, outputs a bit, and takes these many copies of that function. You have Alice and Bob here again. So, and there is another, and there, there is this part which is similar to the cheat sheet part. Uh, I guess we can call it lookup part or something. So, the input to this part is 
strings from some set. Let's say it could be strings of size something like n square. That's what we needed in our separations. But it could be something else as well. So there are inputs over here, so many of them. There are inputs over here. And the task is the following. Compute all these functions, get a string. Go to this location, which is basically decimal of this string, right? It's not really one, but whatever, whatever it is. And then do the following. If you reach this location, compute the XOR of the inputs, the bitwise XOR of u at b and v at b, and feed in this function g. So g only accepts these strings. So g works at, at the, looks at the XOR of these guys and looks at all these guys over here. Looks at the input given here and then outputs something. So this whole function outputs a 1. If g outputs a 1, otherwise output is 0. So our main technical result is the following. What we show is that if the function g is reasonably non-trivial, which is satisfied for our case, the randomized communication complexity of the combined function, the whole function, is related to the randomized communication complexity of the, of the single function of the first one. And similar thing holds, holds also for the information complexity. And well, the intuition is very easy. The thing is that if you really want to know which location you need to go to, you need to solve at least one of these functions. And to solve, you need to communicate. So that's the intuition for this result. But what I would like to do is go into a bit more detailed proof for a simpler, simpler function, not really in its full generality. It's going to be a fairly classical discussion for a few slides, so let me quantize these guys at least to keep our quantum spirit alive. And let me give a very simple function. It goes like this. Again, the same thing. There are function f1 to fc. They take inputs from here. And the task is very simple. Compute these guys, f1 to fc. Look at the location. Go to some location, let's say ub. And simply output the XOR of ub and vb. This simple function, we can ask, what is the what is the randomized communication complexity of this whole function in relation to the original function? Again, the idea is similar that, okay, if you want to solve, if you really want to find this location, then you, you rather solve these functions properly. Otherwise, you will never know where to reach and what to output. But, well, the proof is not always given in words, so we have to go through some uh, mathematics, so let's go, let's go this way. So when we say that a function has randomized communication complexity something, it can be interpreted in the following way, using a very, well-known result of Yao, which is known as Yao's minimax principle. It says that there is a distribution over the inputs, which we'll call mu here for each of these guys. I mean, these are same guys, so let's look at the first guy. There is a distribution which is known as hard distribution, such so that if Alice and Bob were given the input x, y from this hard distribution, then they really take lots and lots of communication, same as the randomized communication complexity of f. So our idea is very simple. We'll look at the hard distribution for this guy, for this function. We'll give the same hard distribution independently to each of these guys. And this whole part will be all independent and uniform. And then we'll see how, we'll just try to lower bound the randomized communication complexity of the whole function given this distribution. And was your, what yours minimax principle says is that if there is any distribution for which you can prove a lower bound, then the randomized in the worst case is also large. So we'll, go, we'll use this, this, this thing and we'll continue. So let's say Alice and Bob had this distribution. They did their communication for some time. They didn't communicate a lot. They communicated much less than the communication required to solve each function. So let's say they communicated. They had some randomness, and they ended up with something called transcript. Transcript is simply a collection of all the randomness and, and the public randomness and the communication that was used by Alice and Bob. So here's the transcript. What I claim is that the first st statement is true. What it's saying? that the information that the transcript contains about the output of these functions, condition on these three random variables is small. Now, why is that true? Suppose it was large, the first statement. Then I'm going to give you a new protocol, which will compute this particular function, f. And then the contradiction will be that, well, you cannot really compute f with this much communication, because this communication is less than the communication required to solve f. So this has to be, cannot be large. So let's see why is it, what happens if this is large? If this information is large, then Alice and Bob will do the following. They'll get an input for the first function here, x1 and y1, from some third party, let's say referee. The rest of the part, they will generate on their own. So they'll use some private randomness, generate f2, f3 till fc. For this part, they will generate both u and v. After all, these are classical random variables, so you can share them. Like Alice and Bob both can possess uv, uv on their side. So imagine that Alice and Bob share both uv, uv, uv like this, and they 
separately share these guys. Now they'll run the protocol pi on this distribution. So Bob will ignore the u which he has, Alice will ignore the v that she has. And then they'll continue and they'll have this transcript. From, from our assumption that this thing is large, the transcript has some high information about the outputs b. So Bob will look at the transcript, he will just, he'll figure out what the b is, and then he'll, hence he'll know what the first bit of b is. Hence he'll be able to output the first bit correctly. But we know that we, with this much communication, we cannot really do that. Hence, this statement cannot be true. Sorry, what is not true is that the information is large, which means the information has to be small. So now from here, we can go to the next line, which is fairly easy as well. Notice that u is fairly independent of b, v, and y. So you can put the u up. It's, it follows the standard chain rule. So what you conclude is that the, whatever the protocol ha was there between Alice and Bob, the information that transcript and u have about the output b of the function condition on v and y, which is on the Bob side, this information is small. That means with small communication, the transcript really does not know what the function was outputting. And this we already knew from the vague idea that we had about the communication complexity, but it formalizes it carefully. Second notion, so let me just state it in a rather non-rigorous fashion. It's saying that averaged over v, y, and b, the transcript is in the, the transcript and the u are independent of b. They really don't know what b is. So they are close to each other. The next thing that we need is the following statement. Uh, this is kind of strange why we need it, but I'll discuss more bit on it a bit later. It's saying, the C, I didn't tell you what C we chose really. The way we choose C is the following. We make C large enough so that 2 to the power C is much larger than the, than the communication required to compute each function f. Which means that 2 to the power C is much larger than the size of this transcript, size of the protocol. So what does that mean? Is that information that the transcript has about any particular guy here on an average is pretty small because it cannot have too much information with many, many locations over here. That's what this statement really says, that even if we fix v and y, because u is independent of v and y, this transcript has low information about each of these guys. Now, th that's how it looks like. It's just saying that averaged over these random variables, transcript and u are fairly independent because there's so many of b's that transcript cannot share much information with all of them. So we got two statements. First statement was this thing that the transcript is fairly independent of the location B. And second was that the transcript and U together were independent of B. So they, they have no idea what the correct output of the function is. And at the correct output, they are fairly independent. We can combine, the, combine these statements and find, lead to the following statement. It's saying that suppose there is an output of these functions, F1 to FC, that's called B. And there, there was a V and Y over this side. The transcript and the correct location which Bob was supposed to know really are independent, which means that Bob, when he looks at the transcript, does not really know what u is. But note that u is a uniform bit. This means that the value of transcript when u was 0 and the transcript when u, were, u was 1 are fairly close to each other. So transcript really carries no information about the correct, correct bit over here at the bit location. But the point is that for a fixed input over here, the output was totally dependent on the u over here. So it means that, you know, uh, Bob really cannot output the correct b, ub, but because function is defined that way that you need to output the correct v, ub, so Bob cannot compute, correctly compute the whole function, which gives a contradiction. Which just go, says all the way back to us that transcript must be of large size to avoid one of these statements. Which means that you need to communi communicate a lot. So that's, that's, how, that's, that's what the proof looks like. So now we are clear of the classical path. Let's get back to the quantum world. So, so we showed that the combined function, our lookup function over here, has as much communi randomized communication complexity as each particular function over here. So what are the impl implications? First thing, let's choose G, our new, the function which was acting on this part, the same way as it was done in the G-shift function in the work of Aronson, Ben David, and Kothari. And we choose a good F as well. It requires a bit more technical results, but I'll not go into that. And then we get a total function for which this statement holds, which is the quadratic separation between randomized and quantum. The quantum part, we need to show two things. First, the randomized is large and the quantum is small. The smallness of quantum part follows from the distributed version of whatever was there in the query setting, which basically, we just take the query protocol of Aronson, Ben David, and Kothari, and then we do a distributed version of that, and that works out pretty fine. So this statement holds. So we update the communication part to 2.5 over here. Now let's go to the second part, which, which was the exact quantum. So if you recall, the Aronson, Ben Nebel, and Godhari had this result that they could show 
1.5 separation between these guys. And this same technique essentially gives us a 1.5 separation for communication world as well, using our lower bound. And then now we, what we are left with the third part over here. But this third part is quite classical. There's nothing quantum here, but let me just go through it. So a minus Koganis and Kothari, they showed this function for which randomized was quadratic in U, UN. So it, using our result, it also goes back to the, goes to the communication setting. But what's important is that for this, we need the lower bound that we have for information complexity. Uh, this is because of some properties of information complexity, which are quite nice. It was useful for the function that was given here, but it could not be, have been used if we had a lower bound only on the randomized communication complexity, not the information complexity. So we reach here as well, and it updates the third part. So as, at least for now, the communication and the, inf and the query world are at par. So let's see how does this correspondence goes. So I'll finish the talk here and just go with some open questions. The first question is, is there a general lifting theorem for randomized query complexity and to randomized communication complexity? If there was a lifting theorem, then we would have nothing to do at all. Our whole talk would be obsolete, totally useless. But that's not true. So this is a big open question, and uh, hopefully it will be solved soon. And one open question which has been around for a long time really is whether that for total functions, randomized communication complexity and quantum communication complexity are related at all. For the query setting, it's known to be polynomially related. For communication, we don't know. And let me go to the last part, which is, well, not, I guess, not as important as these two, but still I find it interesting that, so in our case, we needed a lot of, lot, lot of blocks for this function. They were, we needed this statement. Basically, it says that, uh, over here, that this thing is small. Which, which required there are lots and lots of blocks here. But it's kind of strange that our intuition does not really, so our intuition is just that if you cannot solve this function, then you cannot find the block. But what if there are 100 blocks here? You, shouldn't, you, should, you should still not be able to find it. So is it true that even with constant number of blocks, we can get the separation that we desire? So that's all I have, and thanks for listening. Questions? No questions in the audience? Yep. Do we know of any separations between zero error quantum and zero error randomized communication complexity? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, do you know any separation? Like, I'm not sure if there is separation in the query world as well. Like, I think in the query world there is a quadratic, well, yeah, almost quadratic separation. Almost quite similar, like using Grover search, something similar? Uh, um, some variant of Grover search. This then, was long back in. Uh, I believe same thing would go to uh, communication as well, because randomized queries would potentially uh, lift to the query world. But the trouble there would be that you don't know a lifting theorem for randomized zero error communication complexity, but uh, you'd, have to, you'd have to look into carefully to really, you know, figure out what's the separation. Like you had to look at go to the communication variant and then look at it carefully, I believe. Other questions? Okay, so maybe I have one question. Um, so you use information complexity to, use a to prove a separation between quantum communication complexity and randomized communication complexity, which means that actually you're proving a separation between Inform classical information complexity and, and quantum information compl uh, quantum, quantum complexity. communication complexity. Exactly, yeah. So uh, can you use th this technique to, to, to prove uh, other separations between information-like uh, complexities and, and communication-like you, complexities? You mean quantum information complexity and For example, randomized? Uh, well, uh, if you have a 2.5 separation between quantum communication, that also trivially extends to quantum information complexity as well. Sure. Uh, but are you looking for something more than that? Like. Uh, if, so, well, uh, the, the issue is that there's no query analog of inf information complexity at all. So that's true. You would have to be, try to be creative in the communication world itself. Yes. But apart from that, I'm not very sure if there's a, I don't have a specific example in mind okay. right now. Okay. Yeah. Well, are there any other questions? Okay. okay. Hold on. Let, let's just thank uh, Anwar thank again.